Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back, and today we have on Drew Deach. We are talking all about Creep Show, and I'm very excited about this one because it is interesting in format. And Drew is a first time guest here, so Drew, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. This is a, a genuine treat. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a huge Stephen King fan, but even more so, I'm an enormous Creep Show fan. Yeah, so clearly you are the perfect person to talk to about this movie. <laughs> yeah, I've I've uh I've done an episode of it on on my show Jean Revision on my podcast, but this was a a unique treat because I I wanted to do as much research as possible into the movie and look at it, you know, from the point of an adaptation of Stephen King's because two of the stories that are actually in the movie come from short stories that he published. Right. And, you know, he has so many different short stories that have been adapted into films. Sometimes it's hard to keep track. I'm like, wait, where was this short story? Did I miss it? Did I not get to it yet? <laughs> and that's sort of how I felt with this because I had read the comic first and then you were like, oh, yeah. And I read the short stories. I was like, well, I definitely didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's 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 tough tracking them down. They've never been collected into one of his short okay. story collections and and these are you know very early in his writing career yeah but it, i think creep show creep is a very very interesting movie in king's filmography for a number of reasons one being that this is his screenwriting debut uh he, he has the sole credit as the screenwriter but I think it's also interesting that this is the theatrical film that comes out after The Shining. Right. You know, which which was a huge critical and financial kind of success at the time and has become, you know, hailed as a classic. But King was very, very vocal about his displeasure with uh, Kubrick's adaptation. Absolutely. And yeah, and Creepshow kind of feels like him taking the reins a bit uh, with his own material. I like that he does that, too, because we see over the years as his career goes on that he starts doing things solely for TV. And mm -hmm. it's very interesting to sort of look at that. And, you know, I'll be doing Storm of the Century later on. And I have, you know, the actual book of the screenplay and the movie. So, you know, I'm I'm still playing around with doing that in one episode like we are here for Creep Show, just because, you know, the screenplay is the movie pretty much literally. <laughs> so, you know, that that might make more sense as one episode. But with Creep Show, I found it interesting because of the format too. You know, you have these shorts that are basically put together and they're given these, you know, little spots in between that connect each story, you know, with the animation and everything like that coming in and looking at the actual comic book in the movie, which is pretty meta, if you ask me. And just to have it be these five stories, totally unrelated, as far as I can tell, unless I completely miss something. And then <laughs> you just make them into this two hour long feature film, which, you know, it's hard sometimes when you're watching movies because at times you'll feel like they're super long and you'll look and it's like, oh, this movie is like three hours long. No wonder it feels like I've been <laughs> sitting here forever. But because of the format with Creepshow, you're like, oh, OK, I just watched, you know, five mini movies in two hours. That's not bad at all. I find Creepshow so fascinating because it's such a clear homage to the EC comics and, and DC comics uh, horror period of kind of the, the 50s and right. into the 60s. And that's really the only connective tissue in the movie is that, well, these are all just tales taking place in this comic book uh, that, that we see in the intro uh, called, called Creep Show. And it, it's a chance, I think, for all of the people involved, uh, Stephen King and, and George Romero, Tom Savini, you know, who I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about all of them and their contributions to the movie. But it really feels like these kids who grew up with these comics getting to do their own version of it and just having a ball. And, and for King specifically, I think this is the first time on screen and maybe in written form at this point in his career that we get a sense of his gallows humor right 
it's one of those things where you can tell this is different from anything else that he's done right off the bat, pretty much. And, you know, I recently watched the 1979 version of Salem's Lot, which because of the practical effects, it does have some of the same vibes as Creepshow, but Mm -hmm. not quite to the same extent. And because we're getting the different stories here and you're blending in some animation with the live action depictions of the stories, it's just something that takes on a unique form. And you know that you won't see something like this that isn't necessarily creep show related again no i think the the animation in the beginning when, when we get the wraparound story uh which has a young boy who's getting scolded by his father for for reading terrible horror comics uh, <laughs> w- w- which is great which which you know that that was a a, a real movement in the 50s and, and 60s as a response to these and this is kind of king and romero and all of them saying like yeah let's let's poke fun but when when we see the creep, the the skeleton outside the boy's window, and it turns into a cartoon, I think it's a great way of saying to the audience, look, we're going to have fun. We're going to scare yeah. you, but this is all in good fun. Exactly. And that sort of brings me to wanting to talk about the stories specifically because you have some great cast members in each of these stories you know I had literally watched this for the first time the day before we were recording this so it was brand new to me I had read the comic a week or two ago and I had no idea that they had names like Ted Danson and Leslie Nielsen in this and stuff like that and you know even though I am younger and was not around when this came out it was one of those things where it's like okay you know they got big enough names to where I recognize them and this is happening in 1982 so you know that kind of stands the test of time as well because you're like oh okay you know these people look familiar oh Ed Harris is in this one and things (laughs) like that so you know having familiar faces is always nice and I think that's something that they've been pretty good at doing with the early adaptations because obviously Jack Nicholson is one of the biggest names at the time when The Shining comes out and he just keeps that streak going too so you know I think it helps some of these age a little better too because obviously there is some cheese factor to older movies no matter what kind of movies you're looking at but you know, that helps with practical effects as well. So I think, you know, the casting and practical effects are really what can make a movie do so well down the line. And obviously, you know, you have in the notes here, it's going to be a series next year, or technically this year by the time everyone is hearing this. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Shudder is going to be working on a creep show series. So it it has stood the test of time. And it's just something that I think horror fans can really nerd out about. Well, yeah, I I think that it's such a, an amazing meeting point of talents at, at that time. You have Stephen King, who this is really when his star takes off because, you know, his his books had been doing extremely well. But now he's doing well in the world of cinema. You also have the director, George Romero, who was certainly well respected, but had always still been on the indie fringes of, of filmmaking with his career. Creep Show is the first time that he worked with a major studio, in, in this case, Warner Brothers. It's the first time that he got a real sizable budget to work with. And, and like you said, with the casting, he used the studio influence to be able to get a lot of actors who were either at the time v- very young, like Ted Danson and, and Ed Harris, uh, but also to get a large stable of actors that would be recognized by a, an, an older or, or at least, you know, more mature audience. You know, you right. have people like like Leslie Nielsen uh, or E.G. Marshall, who was, you know, and stuff like 12 Angry Men. The the casting of this movie was taken very seriously. Uh, and I think, like you said, it 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 is given the movie a longevity because as as fun and as knowingly cheesy and goofy as the movie's intending to be the cast is playing it pitch perfect exactly and 
I think this is a good segue into just talking about the individual stories and Father's Day is the first one that we see both in the comic and in the movie. I know I think two of them get switched up as far as Mm -hmm. the order goes in the movie, but, you know, while the practical effects don't necessarily stand up as well today, because as we'll see in some of the other ones later, you're like, yeah, okay, I can definitely tell that's not really all that realistic, but just the sheer effect that these things have with how they look, especially for the time period, that's something I really try to keep in mind when I'm discussing, especially these Stephen King movies, because it's like, all right, well, you know, Salem's Lot, TV movie in 1979, (laughs) the expectation can't be super, super high there as far as the quality of the effects and everything go. And, you know, Creepshow obviously had that bigger budget, like you mentioned, but it's still 1982. It's not like, you know, CGI is blowing up and they're able to do all of this fancy stuff that they can do today with movies. So it's still enjoyable for what it is. And if you go into it with that mindset, I think you're a lot better off than being like, oh, well, you know, this better be the best movie I've ever seen. Well, well, I think Father's Day is kind of the the perfect story to start with, because from a yeah. fr- from an inspiration standpoint, it is a textbook Tales from the Crypt vault of horror type story about a resurrected zombie uh, <laughs> wreaking vengeance on, on, on a whole bunch of people. But I think it also does a really good job at, you know, coming after the animated credits, which are really well done. I think this is Father's Day shows you like, hey, look, we know this is all kind of a haunted house kind of feel to the movie. Yeah. The It's not it's not going it's not striving for realism. And I think that's one of the things that the movie does best and does this quite a bit in Father's Day is the use of actually creating comic book panel shots. Yes. Which which is so, which, you know, at, at the time, I think might have been kind of jarring to audiences. It's something that, right. you know, in the wake of stuff like Scott Pilgrim, we can be more accepting of blending that kind of visual style. But immediately it's like, hey, look, this is a cartoon. We're goofing around and we want to have fun with you. So when when the skeleton comes up out of the grave and, and especially on the recent um, uh, Blu-ray release from Scream Factory, w- which I rewatched for, for this episode, it's like, oh, yeah, if, if you want to look, the seams are there. You can see where the actor's mouth is underneath the, the latex and everything. But <laughs> but it, it definitely feels like a statement, especially for Tom Savini as an effects person, because this is kind of the first time Savini got to do creature effects. Before this, he was just known as the guy you called when you wanted to like explode somebody's head or stab somebody and make it look really well. Right. Uh, This is the first time that he gets to create monsters. And I think that he, he really got to let loose and the zombie and father's day for his Halloween costume as it may come off is still kind of an iconic looking zombie yeah i was definitely going to bring up the comic book panels too because we see those (laughs) throughout you know we see them in different forms too when you have aunt bedelia driving up you have the two different angles so it's like you're looking at two different at two comic book panels right next to each other and it's showing this motion from different angles and then you have the little flashback scenes where the patriarch is wanting his cake and we get that in a little frame on the screen and everything like that. So they used it in different ways too. And they use sort of different styling. So it's like, okay, you know, here's a flashback to when this guy was still alive and here's just some fun little comic book panels of her arriving and everything like that. And I think that really fit the tone of what they were trying to do. And Obviously, then at the end of each story, they have, you know, the look at the last panel in the actual comic. Right. And and, and it'll kind of shift and blend into the comic book animation. Yeah. But th- there's there's also just the the stylistic choices to have completely unrealistic, unmotivated as far as the realism of the scene lighting where you'll just have these sharp reds and and sharp blues that it's like 
I don't know where these light sources are coming from, but it's creating that kind of comic book mood to the yeah. point where the finale of Father's Day has the first introduction of these wonderful shots of just the actors pretty much looking directly into camera and screaming and having the colors shift and there's a, a scrim behind them that's cut into some, you know, wacky, expressionistic comic book design. And I think if you show somebody those shots, it immediately tells you what kind of movie and what kind of tone Creepshow is going for. With Father's Day, too, I think they did a nice job of having a different tone inside the house versus outside. You sort mm-hmm. of have this darkness rolling in outside, but inside it's still well lit. You know, they're dancing and having a grand old time, but then outside, you know, Aunt Bedelia is dying and then, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Hank is crushed <laughs> and it sort of just snowballs from there and you have the other effects as well you know like obviously fog machines were a big thing for oh, yeah. this it's, movie it's, it's, it's it's taken to comedic levels with the fog but, yeah <laughs> but but again I I don't think any of that is unintentional I really think that they knew that that's what they were going for yeah. um and and the only aside that I have to mention in Father's Day is if you listeners out there have never seen Ed Harris's dance during this <laughs> sequence, you have to look it up. It's one of the purest pieces of joy in American cinema I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. It is so goofy. Yeah. Well, I think we can move on to the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill. And there's quite a bit to discuss here because, you know, this is the story with Stephen King acting out Jordy Verrill's part. And, you know, to me, his eyes were so big the whole time. And I was like, oh, yeah, you can, you can you can use the eyes and like move them. They don't have to be one size the whole time. And it was yeah, he, pretty comedic. He's definitely playing it very kind of wide eyed. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and and it's interesting because, I mean, this is, you know, King King kind of predates Stan Lee as the cameo uh, guy who, who he'll, he'll show up in a lot of his stuff and other people's things but this is his first real for foray into acting um he had had a small role in romero's previous film to this night riders which also had ed harris and um you know him and king struck up a friendship and eventually that led to creep show coming around and fr- from what i <laughs> from what i've garnered uh king was apparently not very enthused with his performance in this movie uh But George Romero felt completely opposite. He was like, this is exactly how you need to play it. It's big, broad. And I think the note that he would always give to King is like, you're you're like the coyote in the old Looney Tunes, like play it like that. And it's interesting because I think the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill is simultaneously the, the goofiest entry and also the grimmest and the saddest. Yeah, this was one where it it's not necessarily my favorite story of the bunch, but it's sort of very Swamp Thing-esque to me. And <laughs> you get that feeling where, you know, in Swamp Thing, from what I have read anyway, you know, he has his ups and downs and sometimes his downs can get pretty dark. And that's what this really felt like to me. And obviously it goes to more of an extreme by the end of it. And it's one of those things where, you know, it's probably not Stephen King's best performance, but he's not an actor. So I wasn't expecting it to be something that would blow me out of the water or anything like that. It was just like, okay, you know, let's see how this goes because it's his, you know, first bigger role, like you said. And it's not even all that big in a sense because these are shorts. Mm hmm. I find it that this has kind of the the biggest buy-in of any of the entries because, right. of course, the, the typical meteor falls from space and some horrible stuff happens. We're all used to. But this one has basically fantasy sequences that are the, the most outright comedic in the whole movie in which Jordy yeah. Verrill imagines going to the college to sell his meteor and it like the door literally says department of meteors <laughs> like that's that's what he think would be at the college um and that there's a lot of 
Dutch angle shots used in, in these fantasies to kind of give it that off kilter look. Um, and I think as, as for the comedy of the piece, King sells it. I, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I crack up every time I watch this movie after he touches the meteor and just goes meteor shit. Um, it's just so, it's so goofball. Um, but because this is, it's, primarily a one-man show there's another actor who shows up in multiple roles uh it it kind of rests on king's laurels and like you said yeah he's he's not an actor so to to carry that weight i think uh it's a difficult task for any actor let alone somebody who is a non-actor it's definitely an interesting creative choice to do that too And obviously, you know, Stephen King can be pretty hands on with some of his adaptations. It just really depends, I'm guessing, on his schedule and his level of interest as far as who else is working on it, which is why we got another adaptation of The Shining later on. But Mm -hmm. it's one of those things where, you know, this one is different because of the fact that he is not an actor and the other actor in it has, you know, smaller roles. So you get this feeling it's like okay you know the spotlight is really on Stephen King here and I do want to note that his son Joe Hill is also in this which I had no idea going into it and he's the boy at the beginning and at the end so you know those sort of bookend moments that wrap the whole thing up well that that's what's so kind of great about creep show is that even though it is a studio movie it had that kind of independent hey let's all just throw our hats in together and make a movie spirit. So he's just like, yeah, why don't we have Joe come in and play the kid at the beginning? Uh, which is wonderful. And he, he gets, he gets a great line in the opening where he's just like, I hope you rot in hell, (laughs) (laughs) which is just a a wonderful thing to have a young child say on screen. But yeah, uh, King was obviously very deeply involved in the production and, and the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill is the first of the shorts that is actually based on his story, uh, Weeds, which is kind of a uh, a riff on H.P. Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space about alien vegetation. And as an adaptation, the the movie definitely falls in with the rest of the the kind of over the top comic book tongue in cheek tone. The story is quite dark and sad um you know we get a lot more kind of inner dialogue with with Jordy um there's there's some added stuff in the story about how he wants to sell the meteor because he just needs enough money to like pay off the bank that's trying to come for his property so that it's there's a little bit more of a even more of a depressing depressing twinge than what we get in this one but it it does have just some I think killer moments uh in the movie again meteor shit but also (laughs) that that final shot of the entire the entirety of Jordy's house overrun and him finally you know having to commit suicide and just saying please god let my luck be in it's like oh whoa i it it takes a sharp turn from kind of the goofy looney tunes episode you were just seeing it's like oh okay (laughs) yeah and the next one we have is something to tide you over which this is the one that has two huge names in it with Ted Danson and Leslie Nielsen and I really enjoyed how the two of them played off of each other because you know Ted Danson's character is being confronted about sleeping with Leslie Nielsen's character's wife and I'm totally blanking on names right now I feel like there were like eight Richards in this and that's probably why (laughs) Oh yeah, there's uh, Leslie Nielsen is Richard, and then I think Ted Danson's character is Wentworth. Okay, um, I don't know. <laughs> Would what not his have first guessed that. Is. No, yeah. Oh, I only know this because I, I I had a, I read the comic and and watched the movie fairly recently. But um, no, th- this is a fantastic display of just getting to watch actors play off each other. And, yeah. And uh, Leslie Nielsen's wife is played by Galen Ross, who most people will probably know as the lead from Romero's Dawn of the Dead. Uh, you know, she's only in it a little bit until we get to see her in, in full makeup. But this this is a wonderful, again, in the EC comic spirit of 
getting revenge. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a flip because in, in most EC comic stories, it would be the, the people who are cheating who are the ones who end up getting their comeuppets. And this one, Leslie Nielsen, who I'm sure most people will know from his spoof roles in The Naked Gun and, and movies like that. In this, he just gets to play the most despicable character. And yeah. it's so good. And he's the one being cheated on, which I think makes it even more jarring, too. You're like, wait, no wonder why she cheated on him. <laughs> yeah, like he, like you're, you're like, oh, this is the guy that's getting cheated on? Like, keep cheating on him. He's terrible. <laughs> Like he's he's clearly and I think I think there's a line or uh, an implication about he doesn't really care. It's not about love. It's just that she's his property and you're like messing with his property. Right. And he can't have that. And he's so rich. It probably doesn't even matter <laughs> if his mm -hmm. wife leaves him because, you know, even Wentworth is like, you know, she doesn't want the money. She doesn't really care. <laughs> you know, you suck. <laughs> Yeah, she just wants to be rid of you. Uh, and he's like, well, well <laughs> he's so rich that he could afford basically his own beach in which to murder people. Yeah. It almost makes you wonder if he's done that before, too, because of how well planned it was. Oh, well, well, later when they when when you see the inside of his apartment and he's got tons of videotapes, you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did catch on to that. I was like, oh, this is extra creepy now. <laughs> Yeah, like what what else is on those videotapes? And of course, Nielsen's performance is one. He's like, you know, just humming really jauntily while he looks through them. Like he, he he's just it's such a great performance to show people who only know Nielsen for being kind of a goof. Because in this one, it's like, man, I hate this guy. Yeah. And you have the moment where, you know, the two come back from the dead and they're traipsing all around his house and obviously you know they are filled with you know sort of like algae and just stuff hanging off of them when they show up and i just love the reaction on richard's face and especially when he shoots them it's like okay clearly that isn't working and then you choose to throw the gun at them as if that would <laughs> that would do anything that's again another kind of uh comic book cartoon moment of yeah of, of a, just a little kind of hilarity but i love the the design for the the water zombies and and this cool kind of bubbling effect that they give their voices uh it, it's 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 a wonderful kind of combination of creepy and kooky i mean i i remember seeing this movie as a kid and this was really the first segment that kind of scared me. I was like, oh, these things are that that's a creepy design. And when he shoots them and there's just like black green water that comes out of their heads, it's like, oh, it's gross. Yeah. One of the things, too, is when you are adapting comic books, at least, you know, back in the day here, because obviously now they can make things look exactly like they do in the comic books. But I thought they did a very nice job of having all of these creatures and monsters look how they did in the comics and obviously that gives it that little cheese factor when you're watching the movie but it's something that works for the audience who is going to go see this you know I knew full well going into this that it would have that sort of comic book element to it and it wouldn't be like watching Iron Man or Captain America or something now where it's like okay cgi is doing most of the work here for this it's the practical effects that give it that comic book feel and i think that just helps as far as you know getting the story across especially when you know they're all waterlogged and tracking all of this stuff in with them and then you get that reaction on richard's face and it's like okay you know it might not look all that great in 2018 but it works perfectly for what they're trying to do well I, I think it's it's distinct and and something that i think has happened as our culture has grown up with comic books and subsequently comic book adaptations that have become very successful i think we've been more and more trained to view comic book adaptations from a grounded perspective which is one of the reasons why the the marvel cinematic universe and the christopher nolan batman movies were so successful is that they approached their characters 
from a very believable standpoint, no matter how ridiculous or crazy things get, they try and approach it from something that you feel might exist in reality. But before all that happened, comic books really were the realm of unhinged imagination in terms of visual creation. And the language of comic books is something that we're, we're all, you know, very innately familiar with, but seeing that translated to film, I think can be jarring for some people because they don't expect these things to come off so cartoony while also being live action and real. But I I think it, it makes these things memorable. It makes the monsters in creep show memorable uh, as you know, I, I don't know what a grounded, realistic approach to waterlogged zombie ghosts <laughs> is, but but the the creep show one, it's like, oh yeah, that's an immediately kind of recognizable design. And you know, as as we'll go on to the next one, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to kind of the the most famous monster of yeah. the creep show <laughs> canon. Um, but yeah, I, I think that. Creepshow is an important comic book movie because it's one of the first movies to try and imitate a visual comic book style, which is something that we've kind of moved away from in recent years. Absolutely. And, you know, we're definitely going to just dive right into the crate here because we need to talk about that costume for that monster. Obviously, it definitely looks like a Halloween costume, but it's one (laughs) of those things where it takes this animal look that you're familiar with and it just gives it these horrific teeth and these yellow eyes and you know when it's in the crate and you just see those yellow beady eyes it's like oh uh uh-oh we don't want to open that (laughs) well the crate i think as as a standalone little short if you just watch it i think it's a great piece of of education on how to reveal your monster because it does it in little pieces slowly. And, you know, like at first you just see the crate when they're starting to pry it open. You hear this weird kind of like cooing, whistling sound. It's like, okay. Then you see the eyes. Then you just see a hand. Then later they just show a close up of the teeth. It's instead of giving kind of a, a big gigantic revelatory, let's linger on it for, 15 seconds hero shot it deals the monster out in little bits and pieces so even when you do get a good look at the monster you still feel like oh wait well what did it what did it exactly look like if you ask somebody to draw the full monster they'd be like well i know it's got teeth and there's fur and everything and um they'd have to go grab the comic book to know because it's (laughs) it would be an image in there but yeah i know what you mean because even when we see the full monster it's for a split second pretty much it Mm -hmm. you know it grabs people and it disappears into the darkness which is why it's under the stairs you know it kind of willingly goes back there we see professor stanley leave and you know go get someone else and when they show up again it's not where he left it he's like "Uh uh-oh And then, you know, you sort of follow the blood trail and everything like that. And they do a nice job of building up the suspense in this one. I think probably more than the others, too. Well, I definitely think for for most people who love this movie uh, that this is the standout segment. And, And I'll say that I think another great element of the monster is that it gets bits of personality, uh, like that whole bit of it crawling back under the stairs immediately without having to be told you're like oh i get it that's where it's it's been for over a hundred years that's its home it's just it just wants to go back under there like and it yeah it's weird for for being just a a horrible <laughs> monster that just eats people i was like oh it just wants to just leave it alone it's been just sitting in its crate like you guys bugged it it just wants to stay under there um, but but no i think the crate uh, stands out also because you have a, a trifecta of great actors in this one. And, yeah. and every, every, I think every segment has its share, but this is really amazing. You you have Hal Holbrook uh, as, as Henry. You have Fritz Weaver as, as Dexter. And then you have Adrian Barbeau, 
uh, <laughs> as Wilma, who I'm I'm sure the character has written and has performed will not win any points on the wokeness scale of today. <laughs> you know? No, she was a but, monster in her own right. I feel like. <laughs> oh, oh, exactly. Well, I mean, th- this is again kind of that classic cartoonish EC Comics take of like this person is just awful (laughs) and and we want to see them get their their comeuppance but um and and in comparison to the actual short story i think this is great because they they do a good job in the comic of setting up wilma but in the short story she's kind of an afterthought and then comes in at the end to get her just desserts but barbo's performance in this this was the first time that she really just got to go off the wall and and play a horrible horrible shrew yeah and it's really funny like when she is just slovenly drunk at the party like ah just call me billy that's what everyone does it's like it's so great i know there are probably people who will take issue with her character as written in her performance but i really think it's it's a standout of the movie she's one of those characters who you kind of love to hate. And I think that's when you know they've done something right. It's like from the moment we hear her, she's instantly annoying. And you're like, yeah. oh, God. <laughs> and you kind of know what's coming, but she just takes it to a whole other level throughout the story. And it's like, is she ever going to stop? And it turns out she does because well, well, she did. <laughs> well, then they, they set up this with a wonderful bit of black humor in which Henry imagined shooting her in the head. Yes. <laughs> in the middle of this party, which it when it applause. first happens. Yeah. Well, when it, yeah, when it first happens, you're like, Whoa, that's pretty horrible. But then one of the party goers turns is just like hell of a shot. <laughs> just, just so, so bleak and, and captures again, that, that gallows humor. Um, but I think that's really great setup for, where the story goes because as it's going on we're like oh there's just there's this monster in a crate that they discovered and it's killing people but then when it circles back around to henry using this monster to commit a murder it's like that's sharp writing yeah especially since we have seen him have these sort of fantasies about killing wilma more than once throughout the story Mm -hmm. and then at first i was like wait is this real? Did it actually happen? Or did he just imagine it happening again? And then you find out, oh, no, he did it. <laughs> well, and a, a, another wonderful bit of uh, performance from Barbo when he's, he drag, you know, he, he's like, oh, you know, sh- it, this girl that, that Dexter attacked, she's curled up underneath the stairs and he gets her in there and he's slamming her on the crate. Like, come on, open up. It's meal time. Come eat. And it doesn't. And she just starts berating him again. She's like, that's just great. Henry. That's just you all over. You're no good in bed. You're just, it's just like at that moment, you're like, Oh, please pop out of that crate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And thankfully it does. And like you said some people might have issue with how that character was written but again these are things i try to keep in mind too with the time period obviously probably not something that would fly in 2018 but you know there are those early stephen king stories and novels where you can really see their age just by sort of the language and stereotypes that are used and everything like that and it's one of those things where I think his writing has evolved with the times enough to where it's not something that I find super concerning. No, and I also think it's it's fair to point out that it would be more of an issue if it was a if it was one sided in the movie. If it was like the all the women are just shrews or right. sex objects or something. There is equally, if not more, despicable men. In this movie, um, it's again, it's just channeling that very macabre morality tale of the EC comics in which, yeah, most people are pretty awful, but they're going to get their comeuppance in a supernatural and probably gory way. Um, so and like you said, I think King's King's not somebody who is stuck in the past and sticking to his guns about things that have evolved over time. Um, he is he is a progressive at at heart, and that's reflected in his writing. So like you said, I don't think it's something worth kind of taking issue with. 
Yeah, and speaking of those despicable men, we have another one in They're Creeping Up on You, which is probably my least favorite just because I don't know anyone who likes cockroaches at all. You know, <laughs> well, it, there's just so many of them. And this it's funny because I was watching this and I knew this was coming up and my mom had been <laughs> sitting on the couch only like partially paying attention to the movie. I was like, you might want to get up and leave now <laughs> because I know how much she hates them. And, you know, I hate them too. If I see one, I'll get it. I'll flush it. I'll squash it, whatever. But then this is just like an overload. But then at the same time, it's happening to a guy who is horrible. So you're like, eh, well, Sucks for you. <laughs> well, it, it's so funny you mentioned your mother because this was when I was a very young child. The realization of my own mother's phobia with cockroaches, um, as me and my father are watching it on on TV, uh, this came up, and she immediately was like, "Oh, this is the one with the roaches. I can't, I can't." <laughs> um, but but I think this is. I do think this is usually looked upon as as the weakest um it's it's unfortunate because it's the outro story and those usually are expected to be the real big bang which it is from a gross out effect standpoint yeah <laughs> but i think it's also the only story that's trying to trade in a little bit of symbolism and and because ups and pratt who is this you know howard hughes shut in who just despises everyone the the roaches are kind of symbolizing all the people that he's stepped on and all these how he views humanity he thinks yeah. humanity are are bugs and this is kind of their comeuppance on him it's not subtle or deep you know, right uh symbolism but it's something that i don't think is really as present in the previous ones but all that's going to go down the drain as soon as you start throwing thousands of cockroaches on screen because that's all people are going to remember is how gross it is yeah and i i don't know what they did but they all looked so real first off so it makes me think they kind of just like dumped bags of them in there or something like oh, that oh yeah well they they had these guys go down to south america and just collect thousands of yeah. them and that's kind of what i figured i was like there's no way they did any cgi on this it's like these are definitely real <laughs> oh yeah well i know in some scenes like to fill up like the the sink they just painted yeah. like peanuts and and stuff like black um or the the final shot where the entire room right. is just you know yeah. halfway full of them um but no for uh, most of the shots they wrangled thousands of roaches and they you know that when they were been fun <laughs> oh yeah well then they when they were shooting this in the studio they were like you can't you can't wrangle them like once they're out they're out and they were like people were finding roaches in in that set years <laughs> later <laughs> i like, imagine because they're like, yeah so so i think if, if you know if this gets made today and it is just going to be a bunch of you know cgi roaches i'm sure you can make that gross but I don't think it would be nearly as effective because if you talk to people who've seen this movie, everybody remembers the roach segment because it's just tons of close ups of them or, or like the moment when he realizes he's been grinding them up in his food processor and eating them. It It's awful. <laughs> it's it's really awful. But again, I think that's the intention and I think it it succeeds at really being the gross out entry in the movie. Yeah, and I imagine, you know, like myself, other people probably simply don't like it as much because of the cockroaches. And yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where anyone who has ever lived in a big city has probably had to deal with them. And, you know, I was in college in Philadelphia, and that's a city where it's like, no matter where you go, you're kind of going to run into roaches <laughs> and mice and just critters in general, because it, you know, it's hard to keep a big city like that completely clean of bugs of course <laughs> especially yeah, with the and, humidity and, too i feel like that just makes the bug factor even worse <laughs> oh yeah and and i i think that that alone just having the bugs there and having them show up i mean really the moment i i think the grossest moment is when he realizes he's been eating them but of yeah, course yeah definitely the, <laughs> the big gross out is when they have a full cast of eg marshall who, who i do think is really great in the role is just pay, playing this it's one note, but it's like a wonderful kind of Ebenezer Scrooge yes. horribleness. Um, but when you have him in the end, 
when the lights go out and all the roaches are gone when the lights come back on and you're like, what happened? And then they burst out <laughs> of his body. That is a, I, I think they knew they had to save that for last. Cause if it was anywhere else in the movie, that's when the audience walks out. Yeah. And then you sort of just get that closing shot. Like you mentioned where the entire room is covered in them. And then it turns into the comic book panel and we get our little outro piece with, Joe Hill again and his voodoo doll that he has ordered, which the garbage men notice. <laughs> yeah, which a uh, nice little cameo there from Tom Savini as, as one of the garbage men. Um, and yes, the, the wraparound story of this father who is, you know, who is being abusive to his son for reading that crap, that horror crap, as he calls it, um, ends up getting <laughs> getting his comeuppance by getting pretty much poked to death. Uh, through, <laughs> yeah. through the magic of a voodoo doll it's a nice little again black humor intention note to leave the movie on saying like see we love this horror crap we think this horror crap is all in good fun and there's no reason not to have fun with it and it's it's a small wraparound you know for, for anthology movies some movies discard a wraparound entirely some make the wraparound more integral to the story this is just a nice little bookend like a nice little coda to like yep this is what we were going for and again ending with the animation of the creep which holding the comic book and the candle going out is another kind of like i hope you guys had a good time we meant to scare you but we hope you leave with a smile on your face yeah, plus you have that character in the comic book sort of doing narration, too, in between mm -hmm. and everything like that. And while we don't necessarily get that, so to speak, because they just end up showing the comic book itself in between the shorts, it's one of those things where if you've read the comic, that character is instantly recognizable. And they even do, you know, like a little live action version of it at the beginning when he shows up in the window and everything like that. So I think that was a pretty cool way to sort of blend the live action with the animation. And it looked pretty good. And like you said, the opening credits looked very good for the time period. And I think that's something that is always interesting to look at because you could tell they put a lot of time into that. And obviously with the wraparound story there, that's something a little extra too. And you're like, okay, you know, this is something that makes this thing work as a whole because you have this consistency of, you know, this little story at the beginning, we wrap it up at the end and you have the animation in between each one. So I really like that it sort of kept things flowing in a nice, consistent manner. Well, there's even some some foreshadowing to the wraparound in which during one of the transitions between the segments, the animation is the comic book flipping open and we see a page of ads for, you know, like x-ray goggles and goofy yeah. stuff like that. And we see the voodoo doll ad, but a piece of it is clipped out and you're like, oh, that's, you know, file that away for later, folks. Um, but yeah, I, I love that this is very directly homaging the, the tales from the crypt, you know, the, the creep character is the crypt keeper, or the vault keeper in, in the original comics. And and really considering that it would be about seven years later after Creep Show came out that the tales from the crypt show on HBO came out. I, I think that show owes part of his part of its existence to Creep Show because Creep Show was the one that kind of said, hey, these things have value and they're fun and there is an audience for this and a generation that grew up on this that now wants to do their spin on it. And I think King and Romero and all of them approached it with so much love and admiration and saw the value in these things as, as a piece of entertainment and delivered a product that captures all of that while also doing its own stuff kind of visual take on it by being very 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 comic booky i just really love that this allowed stephen king and george romero to team up on something because you can always wonder what if you know what if this never happened but it did and i think it just has a lasting effect especially on horror fans and 
I've definitely been considering myself more of a horror fan lately, especially as I dive into things like, you know, this podcast going all in on Stephen King. And, you know, for the most part, I'm going to be reading and watching a lot of these things for the first time. It was something where I was, you know, six to ten books deep into Stephen King's bibliography. And I was like, you know what? I'm really enjoying myself. So let me make a podcast out of this. And, you know, here we are. I don't know how many episodes later already because there's just so much to talk about. But to see these two team up, it makes me want to dive into even more horror stuff that isn't necessarily Stephen King related because I know George Romero has such a big filmography to dive into as well. Oh, I mean, that that's that's amazing to hear. I mean, it's definitely and Creepshow, I think, is kind of a great soapbox for that kind of sentiment of saying like, hey, horror is horror is not only valuable but horror can be a lot of different kinds of experiences i mean C- creep show is a it's one of my favorite movies of all time but it was a very important movie for me growing up because it was the first time that i realized that being scared and having fun weren't mutually exclusive uh yeah. that that it's okay to jump at at the ghost because well the ghost isn't actually going to hurt you and it's all in good fun you know this isn't a a Blair Witch project or a Saw movie where it's really trying to you know be horrific this is something that's saying like hey it's okay it's okay it's okay to be scared by zombies and sea ghosts and monsters and crates and say well that was scary but it was also really fun and funny. And I think that's one of the most valuable things to take away from Creep Show, and something that also makes it, I think, accessible to viewers who might be on the younger side. Like you know that this is something that, while it certainly has its adult content, right? The spirit is very youthful, and I think that's something unique, especially at this point in Stephen King's filmography and his adaptations it's the first one that has this very very it's it's hard to say chipper but this kind of jubilant youthful tone to it um and and i just think that it's it's one that is definitely regarded in the horror community and is still kind of a cult classic Mm -hmm. but i think considering where we've come as a culture with comic book cinema i think it's one that deserves even more reappraisal It definitely is. And it's one of those things where I feel like with horror as a genre, it's something people either get or they don't. And for those of us Mm -hmm. who do get it, it's just this thing we sort of obsess about. And, you know, I'm starting to get to that point. You know, I've been watching more things like The Haunting of Hill House. I went and read the book before watching it too. and oh, Or maybe so I read good. the book right after. I don't remember the order because there are <laughs> so many things to binge watch and read and it's hard to keep it all straight in my head. But it's one of those things where, you know, it's become a genre that I am wanting to dive into more. You know, I went back and rewatched Halloween and I went and saw the new Halloween in theaters just because it was one of those things where... I remember watching Halloween probably earlier than I should have. And (laughs) it's something that just these characters, they stick with you. And I think, you know, the Crypt Keeper is another one that will sort of stick with you. And I'm sure, you know, I'll enjoy getting even more of that as I go through and watch the second and third one and Tales from the Crypt and everything like that. So it's just been a fun experience. And I know you said this is one of your favorite movies and I understand that it's not for everyone. And I think that's something, if you understand that you just start to enjoy the things you enjoy and appreciate things that other people enjoy, even if you maybe don't enjoy them quite as much. And I think horror is a very specific genre for that, especially for those who don't get it. It's like, okay, you horror people go do your thing. (laughs) Oh, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, it's, it's funny when you say, you know, I saw Halloween probably earlier than I should have. And that is the common refrain among so many people that I find f- who fall in love with horror. Yeah. It's these things. That it's like, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have seen that, but I did. And it meant something like it stuck with me. And 
you know, th- that is, I think, why when I you know, when I say, oh, creep show is something you could show young, younger audiences, you know, people are like, oh, it's R rated, it's gory. It's like, yeah, but this is the kind of stuff they should see, you know, when they're young. And as long as you have confidence that they'll be able to handle it well enough, um, it's something that will stick with them. It's something that can sow this seed of love of of love of the genre of love of different types of horror and and learning that when you say horror you're not it's not a blanket thing it's like not not no not all horror movies or horror stories are the same and that's certainly true of king's own work you can see throughout his entire bibliography through his filmography he's not a guy that sticks to one tone like there will be tonal similarities in his stuff but he's somebody who at one point can make something that's kind of a goof and a lark and the next moment can make something that's very grim and serious and straight faced. And and Creep Show, I think, is kind of a great entry point into showing like, hey, you know what? Not all horror has to be dark and mean spirited or, you know, genuinely trying to be creepy. This can just be fun. Yeah. And I, I think it's it's one of the one of the best kind of entry points for that level of horror. Yeah, it's something you don't have to worry too terribly much about. Sure, it's gory, but it's not like they're watching a war movie and people's heads are, you know, flying everywhere. And I mean, granted, heads do get chopped off in this, but you don't necessarily <laughs> see it happen. And I think that's what makes this sort of that good in-between movie like it is rated r but it doesn't really feel rated r some of it's probably more for language than anything else oh sure i i think it just comes down to tone you you can tell the tone of this is trying to have a good time It, it it really does capture that sitting around the campfire telling stories to spook each other kind of mentality it it's not it's not trying to be mean. It's not trying to, you know, it, do- it doesn't have a whole lot on its mind beyond let's just have a good time. And that's why I think I think it's actually had staying power. And and to be fair, you know, Creepshow is not a film that was discarded at the time. It was it opened at number one at the box office. Yeah. You know, dethroning first blood, if you can believe that. Uh, and And it was. Warner Brothers biggest earning horror movie of that year 1982 so this was a success and it showed that hey people will show up for these things you know I'm sure a lot of it was the marquee value of George Romero and Stephen King but also that you know people like to go and see a scary movie where they know they're just there to have fun um and and it's something that I I kind of miss on a on a larger scale, I think horror, as I am a, a, a huge lover of it, you know, horror often reflects what's going on in our society. And if society is in a very dark place, horror usually trends towards darker subject material. That doesn't mean they're not making incredibly quality movies, but it's nice to watch a horror movie that ha- is so it, that wears its heart on its sleeve and right. is saying you know what, just have a laugh and have a jump and then go home and 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 have a giggle about it. Yeah, I think that's a perfect note to end this on. Drew, I want to thank you so much for coming on to talk about this. It's been an absolute pleasure and I look forward to having you back on for some more future episodes here. And, you know, to all of our listeners, this podcast would not be happening without you because if no one was listening, it would kind of be pointless. So (laughs) thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast and I will definitely be back on. 